Book Eight, The Last Day, Chapter Nine, and then Part Two of Two. Author's note This is a work of fiction. This is not based on any doctrine or religious dogma. This is just how I think things could be in the future, how I think they should be. But that's all, just me. Versla Cush Thorn left the dark deserts eight moons ago, only four weeks after their shared great-grandson Lemuel Shin was born. Versala Cush came across the gulf and went straight to young Pear and Versa's home to weep in joy over her new great-grandchild, then weep again harder with sorrow about her own son. Mari marveled again at Lemuel Thorne's progress. He, like so many others who caused such devastation, had earned himself a position in the deepest pit. But he screamed in terror, fury, and shock for only three years. The original founders of Idumea still hadn't stopped after more than 300 years. But Lemuel stopped one day, opened his eyes, and looked around. He saw the company of people he was keeping and gripped his head in agony. Guide Hiram, who kept constant vigil over those who confined themselves to the pit, watched with fascination and reported it to Thorne's family. Only a few days later, Lemuel slowly began to pull himself out of the pit, the weight and agony of his guilt making his progress almost imperceptible. But eventually he was out, having meekly accepted Guide Hiram's hand at the end and was laying on the edge of the pit staring into darkness. That's where Poe found him. Each week, Poe, who always had a view of the distant city and had been trying for seasons to change his heart towards Shem, walked back to the darker depths of the desert to see who else he could find and perhaps convinced to listen to men and women like Perrin and Young Pear and Mari and Tyria Rigoff, who spent their time teaching them. When he saw Lemuel Thorne, grief etching his features, Poe felt compassion for the man who murdered him. It was the first big step to his own releasing process, feeling sorry for the grief of someone else and freely forgiving his actions. He tried to rouse Lemuel, but Lemuel saw and felt nothing, not even his former sergeant major shaking his shoulders. The next day, Poe brought Perrin and young Pear to Lemuel's prone spirit, but they had no success with him either. It was too soon. Lemuel's eyes were distraught, probably seeing from another perspective the pain and horror he caused in the world. He needed to see it all and understand the very depths of suffering he caused before he could begin to try to fix any of it. It was regret that moved him from the pit. It would be a desire to pay for his crimes that would eventually let him see those who could help him accomplish that. His mother, Versala, visited him before she left the dark desert. He didn't acknowledge her either, but maybe he felt her arms around him, because after that, he crawled a few paces away from the pit and sat up. That was when Versa wrote her letter to him and had her husband and grandfather set it in front of him. Today, he opened it. How far he read, Guide Hiram couldn't tell but his eyes had rested on the parchment for hours until he stared back out into the darkness, anguish on his face once again. He would make it out someday, Mari was sure. She examined her feelings about him once again. If he were ready today, she could face him happily. Her feelings about him had changed completely since the last day. Now living in paradise with the Creator and the Nurturer, she had a fuller understanding of Lemuel Thorne. Some people had been deliberately evil, embracing the refuser's influence and knowingly trying to undermine the Creator's plan. But Lemuel had never understood the concept of the Creator, and for the couple of years that he was under Perrin's command, he had been changing, watching Colonel Shin, and wanting to emulate him. If he hadn't been laboring under the pressure of Cain to secure Jaitse at any cost, and wasn't under the influence of Gadaman and Genev to find ways to undermine Mari, 
Lemuel just might have been able to become a different man. He had moments of love and compassion. Drusus had told them how often Lemuel kissed and snuggled his oldest daughter when she was a toddler, how he could make her laugh like no one else, and how his love didn't begin to diminish until he realized he would never have a son to carry on his name. That, again, was Kay and Thorne's influence. Daughters were worthless. Only sons brought honor to their fathers. So much of Lemuel was destroyed by Cain. He was a product of an evil man, with few glimpses of what he could be. But the mercy of the Creator was that all of his children would have an opportunity to know the complete truth, and he was granting them that time to learn it, but only if they chose it. Just as in Salem, no one was forced to believe anything. It was their choices that revealed the true natures of their hearts. And Lemuel Thorne's heart was revealing itself by feeling grief. It made Mari hope all the more that Lemuel could succeed. She felt that someday, or some century, the two of them could sit down and maybe even laugh about the past together. Back in the world less than four years ago, Mari never would have imagined such an outcome. But now she actually looked forward to the day when she could call Lemuel Thorne her friend. Not another lost son, Perrin broke into her musing. She frequently forgot he was an expert in reading her. He already has someone from mortal life who loves him as his mother, she replied. And now he has you acting as his father. He has millions of brothers and sisters. But what he doesn't have a lot of are friends. I will be, no, I am his friend. Perrin kissed her. In fact, everyone had pretty much forgotten about familial designations, because once they arrived, they remembered with acute clarity that they really were all family, brothers and sisters, whose true parents were the creator and nurturer. Physical designations of mother and father were given primarily to help others understand who was responsible for caring for whom. And there were plenty of sons and daughters in need of parents. At the last day, all those who had died and were faithful were restored to a perfected state. But that also included myriads of children, many whose parents were not yet worthy to leave the dark desert. Many had been abandoned or abused by their parents. Some had even been killed by them. But now they were ready to finish growing to maturity and needed parents to care for them. Perhaps one of the most wonderful moments was to watch the nurturer lovingly assign those children to couples who had always yearned to raise a family. Mari and Perrin frequently visited Hogel and Tabit Denzel, along with the seven children they had been given. Each week, the shins were put on the spot by the Denzel children, who were eager to practice their debating skills. Watching Hogel and Tabit talking, laughing, and planning with their four sons and three daughters put a lump in the shins' throats every time. They weren't the only ones realizing their dreams of raising a family. General Fodd and his wife, while still honorary grandparents to Rose and Lemuel Shin, were now also Grayson and Shalia Hafadi, proud papa and mama to five children of their own. Two were girls whose mortal father was Lemuel Thorne, their mothers leaving them to die in trash heaps shortly after Lemuel sent them away. The Hafadis, who took their family's original name, along with their extensive extended family, had two more blonde daughters along with their three sons. Milo and Tyria Rigoff also had restored to them the two babies Tyria lost before she could carry them to full term. She was allowed to be expecting with them again, and five moons after the last day, twins were born to them, a girl and a boy. Brill and Karna and his wife also had a family of their own. They now had the joy of being parents to a set of young triplets, born years ago, too early, to a young woman so addicted to vials that she didn't even realize she was expecting, and a teenage boy who died during one of Brillin's attacks on General Snide. The leaders of the Moreland Offensive frequently came to Colonel Shin for advice, 
but now it was for parenting ideas and weekly play like children game days. Mari thought that after three and a half years of watching the former commanders and their children playing with her large family, massive games of get em and tie up your uncle, Perrin always was in the middle directing the activity, it would eventually become commonplace. But it never was. Mari found herself weeping for joy at some point in the evenings, every single time. Maybe it would be when Brillen, far younger and stronger than elderly Shem, would outsmart with his teenage son, the sergeant, who had once run him ragged all night through the roads of Edge on a false garter chase. Or maybe it would be when Hogel and Grayson huddled with their sons to conspire against Perrin, Pato, and Deck, with much eyebrow waggling and false gesturing. Perhaps it would happen when the girls, led by the two Tabbits, Denzel and Brighter, would yet again beat the boys at Track the Stray Bull, using real and obliging bulls. Or maybe it was when the children, winded and resting for a few minutes, would be entertained by a dubious story about one of their fathers from Uncle Gary Yorden. He was still without his son and wife, but he was making progress with them in the dark deserts. Perrin and young Per frequently accompanied him. Some year the Yordans, too, would come home and be a whole family again. In the meantime, Gary was never alone, spending time with his grandparents and friends and working with his grandfather in the dark deserts, teaching other soldiers weary of fighting themselves. No one was ever lonely in paradise. Not even John Afra. He too frequently joined the Play Like Children evenings and would help Gary Yorden make even taller the tall tales he told about the former officers. And when he wasn't in the dark desert searching out and teaching those who were ready to listen, He was in the company of Mari's old student, Serene, who used to own a bookstore filled with questionable books during her last years in Edge, and who had perished during the land tremor. John, along with his companion Milo Rigoff, had found her in the dark deserts, not too far in, and John remembered how she had been kind to the mentally confused colonel on the occasions he wandered to Edge. When no one else would listen to him, She would take him in, feed him, and share with him stories about the shins until he'd fall asleep on her cushioned chair by the fire. She'd taken in a lot of lost souls over the years, teaching them out of her books in her ways, usually not to their benefit. She'd rescued a lot of starving fileheads, and on three occasions, John Afra. In the dark desert, they started talking, John thanking her for her kindness and he started teaching her, but in the ways of the Creator. John and Milo rushed back to tell Mari and Tyria who they'd found, and the next day, Serene's former teacher and her former schoolmate hurried to meet her. Every day they worked with her, John and Milo accompanying them, and after a few weeks, Serene was ready to face guide Zenus at the Gulf. Shem had blushed then, remembering that it was Serene who had stolen his first kiss, during that first strongest soldier race. But she merely laughed when she saw him squirming. I'm over that crush, she told him with her girlish giggle. That giggle, which Mari had found so annoying when Serene was her teenage student, had been gone for many years. But now it was back with fresh innocence, and Mari delighted to hear it. Took me a few years, all right, decades, I'll admit, to get over the unattainable Shem Zenus. I realized I was fatuated with the idea of you, not actually you. So don't worry, Sergeant. She critically eyed the grandfather up and down. I've moved on. And she beamed at John Afra, who, for the first time since coming to paradise, seemed confused. Even when she slipped her arm into the crook of his, he blinked, unsure. But Mari and Tyria, who were there to walk Serene across the gulf, giggled because they had observed how attentively Serene had listened to John when he spoke and how earnestly he watched her, looking for signs that she needed more explanation. Perrin and Milo Rigoff snorted softly and sent John looks of congratulations. 
Poor John still didn't understand. But he'd learned a few things in the ensuing seasons, his mind perfecting more each day, so that he could comprehend that someone was actually interested in him. Once Serene would be ready for her own perfected body, which would be soon because she was progressing so well, their future could continue too. Everyone had a future if they desired it. Life didn't end with the last day. It merely shifted to a new venue, and every mortal who desired love and marriage and a family would get that. But Mari most loved watching her parents and her little sister. The baby who had been born early when Mari was two years old, taking only one gasp of breath before dying, had been restored and returned to her parents, Cephas and Hysimum. Mari sobbed almost as loudly as Lilla when she watched her parents tenderly take the little girl that they never got to raise, her tiny body now perfected and breathing. She needed to grow up too. Mari spent time each day with her sister in a friendly competition with her father, trying to get her to smile, laugh, then walk, talk, and now teach her to read before her father could. Although she was only three and a half, the same age as her best friend Rose, she was definitely Cephas Pato's daughter and already knew the alphabet and how to sound out a few words. She wasn't being raised alone either. Mari and her baby sister now also had two brothers, trash boys from Ida Mia, who had been thrown into the river when they were just five and six years old, when Lemuel held Ida Mia. It was one of the great ironies that Mari still marveled at, for Lemuel to throw those children, already abandoned by their parents, to a watery grave was reprehensible. But then again, because of his actions, these sweet-faced boys, now eight to nine years old, became the sons of a very proud Cephas and most attentive big brothers to their baby sister. And they absolutely loved everything Hysimum cooked up. To them, their mother was the most amazing woman ever to be born. Nothing made them happier than to work by her side in the kitchen, eating everything she could dream up of making. Hysimum could hardly wait until they became teenagers with appetites to match. Chef Gazada was a frequent fixture in her enormous kitchen, creating with Hysimum feasts that all of Paradise came to marvel at and enjoy. Everything in Paradise was restored, not only families, but abilities. Blind people could see, deaf people could hear, those who lost limbs or had been lamed were as perfected as anyone else in white. Even Lemuel Thorne would eventually have use of his right arm again, once he came to himself. No one found themselves alone, not even Drusus Snide Thorne. At the last day she had been mortified when, as the ancestors appeared, Creer's beautiful and young wife suddenly manifested in front of him. Creer had been holding Drusus firmly, but let go of her as if she were a log on fire as soon as he recognized his wife. The only thing keeping Drusus from feeling completely horrible was watching the sweet reunion between Creer and his wife. Then his wife turned to Drusus. With a warm smile, she said, Thank you. Thank you for making him smile again, for giving him someone to care for. Drusus couldn't respond, because she was so startled that Creer's wife was now embracing her. Her mortification lasted less than three minutes. Her brief romance with Creer wasn't a complete loss. She realized that she could love someone again, and that she wanted to. Every man who ever served in the army suddenly felt it was his duty to search paradise for the perfect match. And she had plenty of men to choose from from the past 365 years. Despite all the help she received and didn't always want, she found the perfect man all on her own. It was at an extended family gathering, two seasons after the last day, that Drusus came to the back garden filled with shins, briders, zenuses, and many others. She signaled to Shem that she would like to make an announcement, and Shem called everyone to silence. Bashfully, Drusus beamed and said, 
all of your efforts to find someone for me have been appreciated, but now are no longer needed. He found me. She motioned behind her, and through the gates emerged a man that made Shem's mouth drop open and Perrin start to laugh. Grampy Neeks? Grampy grinned back at Perrin. And why not, he said, putting an arm around Drusus. This poor woman here has known only officers. I decided she best realized that enlisted men are where it's at. Agreed, Shem said, slapping him on the back. Drusus told the crowd that she and Grampy had started talking at one of Ralph and Joriana's gatherings for former soldiers, some moons previous, and it took off from there. As Grampy... His given worldly name turned out to be Boniface. Perrin could see why he had stayed with Grampy. As Grampy and Drusus gazed dreamily at each other in the Shin's back garden, Mari knew it was right. It was just that, well, even in his perfected and young state, somehow Grampy still had that weather-beaten look about him that made him appear to be perpetually about 50 years old. You see the former sergeant major told the crowd. I've always been called Grampy, but never got to be one. But now? He stepped over and gingerly lifted six moons old rose from a stunned versa. I finally get to fit the title. Grampy Neeks turned out to be a wonderful father to Delia and Priscilla, and yet another grandfather to Rose and now little Lemuel. Rose adored Grampy, and inexplicably called him Leroy. The Shin and Zenith's descendants were also happy beyond their expectations. So far, each of the grandchildren of age had found someone to share the rest of their lives with. Even Zadok had found a spicy young woman from the world who had made it through the last day. But the first wedding was young pair and verses, taking place less than a season after the last day. Versa would have had it sooner, but young Pear still couldn't believe she really wanted him. Even as they walked down the aisle together between their families to stand before Guide Zenus, with young Pear cradling three moons old Rose in his arms to formally claim her as his own, he had mumbled to Versa that she could still change her mind and take another look around for somebody more worthy. She answered loudly that she couldn't understand why he still didn't believe he was the best possible husband for her and father for Rose. That's when the wedding became the most unusual the Shin Brighter Zenus families had experienced. Because for once, it wasn't Shem or Kala or Lilla who cried the most. It was young Pear. He started to sob as he neared Shem. Versa wiping the face of her soon-to-be husband, since he was holding baby Rose, and his tears became contagious. Of course, Shem teared up, recognizing how remarkable it was that the two of them should find each other and choose to become a family. But Pato, being so overcome with emotion that not even Lilla could successfully quiet him, was completely unexpected. It wasn't until Perrin began to join them, with loud throat clearing which didn't hide the fact that he was weeping, but rather instead drew attention to it, that the rest of the extended family, ancestors and mortals, was reduced to gentle laughter and sniffles. Mari fought her own tears, only so that she could watch the strongest men she ever knew weep. Only Perrin, Pedo, and Young Pear knew just how far Young Pear had come to feel so much joy on such a day. It had been just over a season before that he lay on the floor above the dungeon waiting to die by Lemuel's sword. Then, three moons later, he was becoming a husband and a father, surrounded by family he feared he would never see again. It was an exceptionally emotional day. You have to admit that. Perrin interrupted Mari's thoughts again. Quite the peaceful ending for such a turbulent couple. But why do you have to think about that so much? The image of her husband gruffly sniffing and wiping away his copious tears was in her mind again. 
So was Shem's comment of, Now, as soon as Grampy Crybaby over here is ready, we can organize a new family, which got Perrin going even harder. Mari laughed, Because it was such a wonderful day. I can't help it that remembering your crying is part of that memory. Yes, you can. True, I can. But I like remembering it. It was so sweet. Perrin groaned. Mari giggled. Don't worry. Your reputation as the destroyer is still secure, even if you now cry at weddings. That's right, I'm the destroyer, he said with a firm nod of his head. And don't you forget it, woman. Yes, and now you destroy pies, cheesecakes, chocolate. Because I can, he proclaimed proudly, patting his firm and perfect abdomen. Chocolate? Is that the name Hysimum finally decided on? The name my brothers finally agreed on. They came up with another strange name for something else of chocolate she's been working on. This fluffy stuff they want to call moose. Perrin pulled a face. Moose? As in the large deer? Murray shrugged. They seem to think the brown texture of it is moose-like. I don't get it either. But I learned long ago there's not much logic in the minds of little boys. My mother said that whatever they want to name her creations, she's happy with. The only thing Perrin couldn't enjoy in paradise was steak. The reasons were obvious. How can you carry on a conversation with an animal, then ask to devour its haunches? Like everyone else, Perrin ate grains, fruits, vegetables, and items willingly offered up by animals such as eggs and cream. And he apologized to every creature he could find for his previous life. They were all quite accepting. And it was true. The cattle in the world ran from him because they could see the hunger in his eyes. But he had retrained that appetite. Perrin and Mari had reached the long drive that led up to Lilla and Pato's mansion, which was not made of solid gold. Only the roads were paved in gold, since that metal was prevalent everywhere and not valuable in any way except to clearly mark the roads. Several large houses they passed belonged to their grandchildren. Now many of the Shin descendants were waving and calling over to Perrin and Mari on their way to the Shins for dinner. In many ways, very little had changed. They still ate, although they didn't need to, but they enjoyed it, so why not? with their extended families. Perrin and Murray spent one day a week having dinner at the Shins, another having dinner at the Briders, another eating with the Zenuses, another day hosting everyone at their mansion. Then the other three days of the week, they invited over someone they knew in the world. Sometimes it was Mr. Haggick and his family, or Roke, the former owner of the stable at Pools, and his wife and daughter. Roke had once again several hundred horses who liked to hang around in the vast, lush meadows that surrounded his house. Or Perrin and Mari would visit with Ralph and Joriana and the former soldiers they hosted each night. Or would drop by Cephas and Hysimums to laugh with the children. Occasionally, they just cuddled together quietly on the front porch, nibbling on another fantastic fruit they never had in the world. Pineapple, banana mango, or kiwi, naming all the species of animals that wandered by their home or bedded down in their garden for the evening. Life in paradise was easy yet challenging, gentle yet exciting, perfect yet still with room to improve. For example, in paradise, there was no need for doctors because the healing power of the creator and nurturer cured all injuries and illnesses of the mortals an instant after they were afflicted. Midwives were also not necessary because childbearing in paradise was such a delightful experience. A short time after the last day, Erola's brighter, Hollings' expecting wife, felt pains again. Well, not so much pain, because pain no longer existed there. But she felt changes, pleasant and warm. When Salima, Jaitsi, and Lilla realized she was actually in labor and enjoying it, they couldn't help but protest that it wasn't fair. 
Soon their nurturer arrived to teach them the ways of birthing a child in paradise. Within minutes, the tiny girl was delivered, with Erilis literally laughing out her child, and Holling remarking that it was so easy, he wouldn't mind giving birth to the next one. But Salima was worried. The child was small, born too soon. And again, the nurturer taught them that there was nothing to fear, for the baby coughed and spluttered and breathed easily, all on her own. Paradise wasn't a place of death and grief. It was full of life and happiness. But the lack of need of doctors and midwives didn't mean there wasn't anything for them to do. There was knowledge to be gained. Indeed, many mortals discovered their previous work wasn't needed. Farmers needed only to gather in the crops they wanted for that day. No weeding or watering or planting necessary. Soldier skills weren't required in a place with no war. And law enforcement was unheard of since crime wasn't heard of either. Yet some professions remained. Scouts and rescuers, by countless scores, were needed to find and teach those in the dark deserts. And in a place where so much needed to be taught, teachers were required everywhere. Mari had plenty to do, but even more to learn from the greatest teacher of all, the nurturer. She taught all subjects to whomever wanted to learn, but in brief bits, because the pure knowledge she could bestow quickly overwhelmed the mortals and astonished the perfected beings. Mari attended nearly every course available, even sitting in on the medical classes attended by thousands of students, including Boscos, Salima, and Dr. Toon. She sat in admiration as the nurturer, in a short 15 minutes, poured into each of them so much light and truth that her audience would spend hours each day for the next week discussing her words, trying to grasp it all, and feeling their own minds expand in ways they didn't know possible. Then eagerly they'd rush back the next week for another 15 minutes. That would take them another 50 hours to fully comprehend. It wasn't only the medical classes which were so thrillingly comprehensive. Every lesson taught was an experience in headiness, and Mari sucked in more about history, archaeology, anthropology, and a variety of other ologies she didn't even know existed. It was early in their time in paradise that Mari discovered something. She had longed to be a teacher in the world, not so much because her father was one, but because she so missed her mother, the greatest teacher by whom she had sat for ages, absorbing all she could before her time for the test. During her life, she'd felt a longing because something was missing, even when she was sure she had everything and everyone she needed. Only once she returned to paradise did she realize she'd been homesick for her perfect mother and father. Mari frequently went to the nurturer to ask her questions, to clarify answers, and to learn how to teach. There was time, always time, for every child and for every request. There was also a division of labor, Mari discovered, so that while the nurturer cared for and taught those in paradise, the Creator oversaw the progress and deliverance of those in the dark deserts. It had been that way always, the nurturer preparing their children for life and welcoming them home again, while the Creator oversaw that life and lent assistance to those requesting it. Overall, it balanced, Mari discovered, and beautifully, just as everything in Salem had balanced, or tried to, Knowledge and experience and duties balanced also in paradise, and perfectly. Mari started up the lane to the Shin's home, but Perrin caught her hand and pulled her back. Almost forgot the tradition, he reminded her. Together they walked over to a tall, clear obelisk, the point several feet higher than Perrin's head. Encased in the clear, pure stone that looked like glass but shimmered more like diamonds, was the prophecy written by Pato and signed by his grandfather, to keep it preserved for eternity and to allow anyone to read it who wished, it remained on permanent display by the roadside, the promise of hope unfolded and suspended flat, the envelope below it, 
Together they nodded thankfully, respectfully to it. It was completed, yet still continued. Paga! cried a happy voice. Mari! Perrin cried back, scooping up the four-year-old who had run to his side. Where's your sister? Where there's one of you, there's two of you. I'm right here, Maggie giggled, peeking around Mari. Are you our escorts this evening? Mari asked her great-granddaughter, taking her hand. Yep! Wonderful, Perrin said, kissing Mari and patting Maggie on the head. And so, the destroyer walked with the most dangerous woman in the world, accompanied by their great-granddaughters, up to the house for dinner. It would be another perfect night. Dorman, the last son of King Orin, shook the hand of Shem, who stood as sentinel at the Great Gulf. In his bright white clothing, Dorman lit up the entire area. Shem smiled cautiously at him. Are you ready for this? I mean, really? Why shouldn't I be? Before Shem could respond, a man jogged up to them and exclaimed, Are you really him? The last son of the king? Yes, this is him, Shem said. Allow me to make introductions. Kuali Pohili, this is Dorman, last descendant of the kings of the world. Dorman grinned and shook his hand. Being perfected, he could touch Poe's spirit better than Shem could. You shouldn't regard me with such, I don't know, admiration. Exactly what has Shem been telling you? Poe grinned at Shem, something he recently remembered how to do. He told me how you were one of the best scouts in the forest for 15 years and how the youngs brought you out of the world. They're eager to see you again, Dorman broke in. You see, the youngs remember you from before our life in the world. But as of yet, you don't remember everything you once did. But after you leave here tomorrow, much more will come back to you. Even your memories with the youngs. Your memories with me. We used to be friends quite a long time ago. Poe sighed wistfully. Oh, that's what parents told me. And while I feel I'm learning and remembering so much, I understand I've barely begun to scratch the surface of what I used to know. I can see why it comes back slowly. Every day I'm overwhelmed with what's poured into my mind. I can't wait for it to be perfected, to take in even more, to remember the youngs, to remember you and learn of your experiences in the world? Poe's eyes lit up. Shem told me how he confronted you in the forest above edge as the youngs were getting you out and how you tried to kill each other, which was kind of hard for you to do since you weren't even armed. Doraman threw back his head and laughed. Well, of all the things to know about me, thanks a lot, Shem. No, I wasn't too skilled at the beginning, that's for sure. And Shem and I became great friends after that. Shem beamed at Poe, who smiled back. Dorman continued, Shem's always been too generous with his praise. I wasn't the best scout, but I did enjoy helping people escape the world my family created. Now, I understand you have something to show me. Poe nodded eagerly, and Shem waved them away. Into the desert, Poe led Dorman, the light fading the further in they went. They passed numerous souls, sitting in the sand or wandering aimlessly. But some were talking with those dressed in white, while others were reading or praying. Still others were refusing to hear or to see or to try. It grew darker, until finally they came to the pit where Guide Hiram kept vigil. If one didn't want to hear the screaming, one didn't have to. Dorman didn't want to. Most of his ancestors were in there, including his brother, Son of Orin, who Shem had killed many years ago before Son of Orin slash Heth could carry out his planned murder of Ralph and Joriana Shen. Dorman wasn't there to see any of his ancestors who had established Idemia and ruled it so cruelly and stupidly for over a hundred years. He was there to see someone else. Even though he'd been told about it, still he was startled at the sight. He's actually out, he whispered in astonishment. 
Poe stopped next to him. Remarkable is the word everyone's been using. Dorman crept closer to the motionless figure, sitting rigidly some paces away from the pit. Dorman crouched to see him face to face, but was met with a blank stare. Lemuel Thorn, Dorman said. There was no response. Look at him, Dorman whispered. Not so fearsome now, is he? If people in the world back then could see the shadowy slip of a being he is now, they never would have cowered in fear of him. They never would have followed his orders. Dorman cocked his head. Truly pathetic. Worse than I expected. Poe shifted. Perhaps, perhaps this isn't the best thing after all. No, Dorman said, straightening up. No, I only meant that I didn't expect to find him so diminished. It's as if he's hardly there. As if what's left of him is so battered and destroyed from the inside out that if there were a breeze, it'd blow him away like a dandelion. How fragile. How utterly brittle. Dorman steeled himself. He had come for a reason. Are you sure you're ready? Poe asked in the same cautious tone Shem had used. Dorman regarded him. What a contrast Poe was to Lemuel. He'd be leaving the desert soon to begin his new life in paradise, but already he shone. For as diminished as Lemuel was, Poe was solid and full and powerful and, well, he radiated light himself. It wouldn't be long before he reached the next stage of having a perfected body. Dorman felt inadequate next to Poe. While Dorman's body was perfected, his mind still had hundreds of years to go. I'm ready, he decided. Again, he squatted in front of Lemuel and reached out to put a hand on his right shoulder. Lemuel Thorne, I am the first innocent man you murdered on a dark night in a forest above Edge. You were furious that Colonel Shin and his family had escaped from the village and were on their way out. But you were also terrified, a mere captain, desperate to prove your worth. Reckless for success, you used Ralph Shin's sword on me, claimed I was Shem, and then believed that lie yourself for many years to come. That was the beginning of your very long downfall. But as you can see, or could see if you allowed yourself to, your decapitation of me wasn't a permanent change. I am again whole, perfected, and completely at peace. You, however, are not. So, as the first man you murdered, I say, Lemuel, I forgive you. I want you to find peace as well. I hold for you no ill will. He thought he should say something more, but nothing else came. Staring into Lemuel's pale, dead eyes was unnerving. Poe kneeled next to Dorman and placed his hand on Lemuel's other shoulder. Lemuel, I am the last innocent man you murdered before Perrin ended your life. I, too, hold no ill will toward you, and I forgive you. I once considered you a friend, and now I want you to know that I think of you as my friend again. I get to leave tomorrow, but I will return to visit you, with Perrin and young Per and Versa. Lemuel, we want to help you. Poe sounded as if he wanted to say something more as well, but Dorman noticed he'd been looking into Lemuel's unresponsive eyes. The two men exchanged fragile smiles. Together they stood up and looked down on what used to be General Thorne. I didn't realize I was still carrying that weight, Dorman murmured to Poe. Not until I unburdened it just now. I feel it too, Poe said quietly back. That immense lightness. If I feel any lighter, I'll probably float out of here tomorrow. Quietly the men chuckled, then sighed as they gazed upon their murderer. Nothing, Dorman whispered. Nothing at all. I feel nothing toward him at all. Just pity. Poe nodded in agreement. He crouched again to say, We mean it, Lemuel. We forgive you. 
Read your daughter's letter that you opened. She forgives you too. Lemuel's right shoulder twitched. And that is the end of part two of two of chapter nine titled, And Then. There's still a little bit more to come. Thank you.